Well, yes, today I am working on a topiary and I'm doing some more hard pruning because this video is all about renovating a, an old, woody, buggy, unkempt topiary. It's a Silverado Sage. I've had these for, gosh, eight years maybe. They go into the greenhouse, and for some reason, this is the only specimen that comes out every year, and it's buggy. It has aphids, it has mealybugs, um, it probably has some scale. It is a virtual plant petri dish of all sorts of critters. And yet every year I have been able to revive these, treat them with neem oil and some other bug spray, give them a hard prune at the beginning of the season. And by the end of the season, they're absolutely beautiful, aren't they, Stuart? Yeah, you can see the bugs. Oh yeah, you can see the bugs. They're really, they're really awful. And normally you guys, I would not be doing this uh, in my backyard, I would be doing this on the driveway, but it's not a very pretty, pretty backdrop for me to be working, so I'm going to do it here today. Now, this is kind of in three phases, and we are going to show you some images of what it looks like after it has started to flush out, put on new leafy growth once the weather starts getting really hot, because this Silverado sage or Texas sage really likes hot weather. It's got a green small leaf that resembles a boxwood almost, and when when kept tightly pruned, it really is a wonderful candidate for topiary. I love its gray-green foliage, and then it will also put out a whole bunch of really vibrant fuchsia-colored flowers that the pollinators love. And like, you, like I say, it makes a great topiary form. Now, I have two of these, and I'm doing two things to them today. I'm transplanting them. I'm gonna put all brand new soil in here. I'm gonna treat them for bugs, and I'm gonna give them a, ha a really hard prune. And I know some of you guys may be naysayers and think, oh, I just don't think that this can be transformed into something that's beautiful, much less alive with all it's got going on in the way of bugs and critters and all sorts of pests. But I promise you, this happens every year and every year I give it the same treatment. Now this year, because I've had to do this repetitively, this year I'm just going to start from scratch. I'm going to put all new soil in here in case any of those bugs are overwintering. I probably should have done this before instead of just top dressing them with fresh compost. But this is what it's going to look like after I prune this one back really hard. It's going to resemble this one. Stuart, if you look closely, you can see that it is starting to put out all fresh new green growth. And once it heats up, it will really go into supercharge, especially when I give it a really, really good feed. At this point, it really doesn't bother me the way it looks because it kind of looks a little bit to me like grapevines look when they're just still kind of branchy and before they start putting on their foliage. So I probably should have had a bigger tarp to catch all of this, but I'll make sure that I practice good garden hygiene once I'm finished. So here's my question of the day. I want to know what your biggest success is in turning a buggy overgrown old plant and renovating it so that it's refreshed and beautiful again. So I'm coming in here, and by the way, I'm using these Corona pruners. I'm not using my more delicate pruning Barnell ones. These are good for really thick woody stems. And I'm gonna come in here, and I mean really, really butch it. I am just gonna give it a very hard prune. Now number one, that's going to restore a certain size and shape that I want, but also it's going to cut off a lot of that bugginess. And you're seeing all of this fly over here, and you're thinking, oh my goodness, and it's flying onto, st it's flying onto Stuart. There's bugs all over me. I know, it's probably flying onto my plants too. I probably should have stayed on the driveway. Let me be a little bit more delicate with that. <laughs> the things we do for our art, right Stuart? 
And that's not whitefly, by the way, you guys. That is mealy bug. And it's, it's also not snowing. And so this... Will that hurt any plant it lands on, or is it only in those, uh, those specific plants? And repeat the question, because I'm not mic. Okay, okay. Uh, you wanted to know if it would hurt any plant that it gets on, and is this a problem that could be universal for the other things? And yes, but it tends to be more problematic in enclosed spaces where there's poor air circulation, particularly like greenhouses where this was living. Now, I will come back in here and really monitor these things that are in the vicinity, but I don't think it's going to be too much of a problem, especially if I come back in here and I really am very fastidious about cleaning up all of this. Now what I'm doing here, see look at all of that. If this was an indoor house plant, sometimes you can use an alcohol swab to get that. It looks like kind of little bits of cotton and it's yeah, and it also puts out a, a, a very powdery residue, but these branches are not dead. They still have life in them. And Stuart, let's focus back again over there on that one, because that's about the size of head of a plant that I want once I get it finished, because these will be in an area where they will flank both sides of something. I'm not sure what at this point. I also decided that I really did not like them in these pots, which to me seemed like they were a little bit too tall. Okay, I'm going to eyeball that. And I am paying attention to where this stuff is flying so I can clean it all up. Okay, now I'm going to come back in here. Hopefully they'll appreciate the pretty background. Hopefully they'll appreciate the pretty, pretty background. Here is something else that I'm considering. This one came up and it had growth at the base. So here's another question I have for you guys. Should I encourage this to grow in a double ball, a double poodle form, or should I leave it in a singular lollipop form? And you can see over there I've cut a lot of it off. Okay. You can see over here, and I've, I've removed practically all of the diseased foliage. There's probably also, there's probably aphids on here. There might also be some kind of diseased foliage. Okay, so I am gonna clean this up and I will definitely, I'm gonna get most of the big pieces out of the way. And I will probably come back in here with just a kind of a weak insecticidal soap and spray all of this surrounding area. Okay, now also what I'm going to do, I'm going to remove all of the clippings from under here. And I'm going to really eyeball this. Remove any of that. And by the way, these, I, I typically in my backyard seldom ever get aphids or mealybugs or I sometimes get scale on the euonymus, but typically not. There's pretty good air circulation back here and I try to really keep an eye on it. So that is about the same size. Stuart, do I need to take maybe another inch off or is it about the same scale? I mean, as far as height, or something, well, it's this, a little taller. And a little, little taller. Okay, so what I'm going to... you don't have a whole lot more room from like the bottom. Yeah. 
Okay, yeah, I'm going to take just a little bit more, a little bit more off the top. And these, by the way, are those new Japanese pruners. I can't remember exactly the name of it, but one of you recommended them. So I'm trying them out, and boy, they're really sharp. That's nice when it cuts up better. I know, it's a, it's a pleasant sound, isn't it? And I'm also going to remove some of this internal branching that you see here. So there will, it will have better air circulation in the interior and prevent bugs. And by the end of the season, these are always bug free and they're fine. It's just that I think they might be, you know, a magnet plant. One of those that when they go into the greenhouse, everything goes towards them and prevents them from attacking other plants. Okay, so there we go. That's pretty good. Okay, now at this point I will make sure because I know you will ask, I do have some disinfectant wipes here, antibacterial wipes that I will make sure to use on my pruners before I do any more pruning of anything, whether it's these, more corrective pruning, or anything else in my garden. I will sterilize them really well. Now, at this point, here is my next stage. Are you getting all this, Stuart? I think so. Okay. Okay, so I don't want to save this soil. So I'm going to take this out of the pot. And I am going to remove as much of this soil from the root ball as I can. Now, I don't know that I would do this with every type of plant. But I do know that historically, these are so tough. The other thing is, I don't really want them to get much bigger. And this will kind of help manage the root ball size a little bit so they will stay in a size that's a little bit more moderate and doesn't get too overgrown. And it's mostly the soil on the top that I want to I, I want to replace. And I'm doing this now when temperatures are cool. I don't know that I would do this if temperatures were 110. And I've removed most of that. I'm going to set it back upright. And I'm going to spray this very, very well with a really good insecticidal soap. Now, I happen to know that this one also has, it's for organic gardening, I happen to know that it also has neem oil in it because I read the directions. And this is what I have used every year. Stuart, don't let me spray you, dear. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to spray the top of the root ball under the foliage, all along the trunk. And I am going to be pretty vigilant about doing this, you guys. And I, I will probably, historically, I've done it almost every other day until I really feel like I get good management on it. I'm not spraying the whole garden. Some of you may disagree with me. I just know from history that this works pretty well. Now, while I'm doing this one, I'm going to go back over here and I'm going to spray this one again. Now, once I spray these, these are going to go back onto the driveway until I'm fairly confident that all of this is under control until they start looking pretty again. They'll just kind of be in critical care until they look pretty again. Now, I also, as I said earlier, I wanted to change the shape of the pots that they were in. So they've been in, in this pot, and I felt I wanted something that wasn't 
quite so tall and thin in profile since the plant itself was tall and thin in profile. I wanted something that was a little stubbier and I had two of these urns. These, was, these were part of uh, my signature garden collection with QVC last year. And so I really, I wanted to use these and I think they'll be beautiful flanking whatever I decide to flank. I've got, I've got the, <laughs> there we go, there we go. Now, I've already put some soil in here. This is fresh, new soil. I'm going to take some of this out, but all of this is, is pretty good soil, too. And you can see I, at one time, had some bulbs in there. And this is one of those 50-50 blends. Now, once I get this in place, removed, I guess I could have done this before Stuart, so everybody out there wouldn't have to see me. They like hanging out with me. Do you guys like hanging out with me sometimes in the garden and helping me? Okay, so I've got this over here. I'm going to remove a little bit more of it. Reduce the size of the root ball a little bit more. And this, this soil is pretty tired. It's old and tired. Like I say, these are, gosh, I, six to eight years old. I can't remember. And by the way, when I bought these, because I know you'll ask, they were already in this topiary form. I did not topiary these myself because that would have taken a very long time because when you saw, find them in the nursery, they're typically in one to two to three gallon form, like in a boxwood shape. I'm going to add some Osmocote to this. Rough that up. Um, so it would have taken a very long time to grow a tall specimen like this, which is one of the reasons that every year I spend time in refreshing and revitalizing them because I know how difficult they would be to create and start all over again. So I'm going to put this in here. Take a little bit more out. I am sure some of you out there are saying, oh, Linda, there's got to be a more efficient way to do this. <laughs> Stuart's probably thinking the same thing. And there might be, but you know what? Like this is how I do it. And I'm not as always as methodological as I should, but it seems to work, and I still make a pretty garden. Okay, so there we go. Isn't that right, Stuart? Sure. Isn't that right? You gotta work with what you got. Okay, so now all I have to do is backfill this with soil. And this is where sometimes it helps to have a helper. Now remember, this is not soil that was buggy. This came out of a, a virgin pot that did not have anything growing in it. It just had some soil that was a 50-50 blend of old potting soil and new soil. Does that look like it's centered in the middle of the pot, Stuart? Pretty close, yeah. Okay. And it was in a couple of videos a while back that I talked about how I reuse old potting soil in my wheelbarrow by taking old potting soil, supplementing it by about 50% with new fresh potting soil, sometimes some additional compost, some perlite and osmocote. Lean in towards you. E 
easier to fix it at the outset than to remedy it later. Isn't that right, Stuart? Do it right the first time. If you don't have time to do it right the first time, you don't have time to go back and correct it. Okay. Now, now that it has been repositioned, I'm going to squirt it one more time. I'm also going to squirt the surface of the soil. Because a lot of times these, the directions on, on these will say to the point of drench, drenching or runoff. Okay, now the last thing I have to do is top dress it with gravel. And in these containers, I decided to use a gravel that was a little bit larger than my traditional pea gravel, which by the way, I get in bags from Lowe's. It's called Earth Natural. It's just a natural, a natural color. Stuart, if you don't mind, maybe showing some that's on the ground over there. Uh, the pea gravel. And by the way, most of most of my, my paths and everything, the mulch needs to be replaced with some more pea gravel. Okay, so now, Stuart, would you mind showing some pretty things while I go get my gravel? Now for full disclosure, Stuart and I did talk about whether or not I should already have my gravel here, and we decided no, I would go back there and get it so he would have time to show you his favorite snowball viper <laughs> and anything else that's blooming now in the garden. And as I said earlier, it's, I've had a, a long and blissful day of being able to work outside, something I never get to do. We still have a late night QVC shoot, Stuart. But for most of the day, I have been able to work outside and it has just been dreamy. And pretty soon, I'm gonna have most of my, my projects done, Stuart, and I will feel like the garden is garden tour ready for everyone to see. Though I have to say, I don't remember a spring I've had this many visitors, just casual, casual comer buyers. Okay, now I've got that in place. I need to do one last thing. And by the way, you guys, this is my wonderful giraffe retractable hose reel. I am not paid to say that, I love it. I have three of them, and I think many of you do too. And I'm not gonna pretend like they're not kind of pricey, because they are, I didn't get mine all at once. But boy, Stuart will tell you, they are worth every penny, aren't they? Because <laughs> he waters for me sometimes. Now over here, I have, a beautiful topiary I'm starting to create. That's, okay, you can show them, but that's just a tease. That, that, we'll save that for a different video. But I will love the way it looks because it's got kind of variegated green and white foliage, which will look beautiful with this gray foliage. So I am gonna clean this all up, you guys. I am going to make sure that none of these critters spread around. I'm going to have Stuart help me heave ho these back onto the driveway, clean up all of my mess, and just hope that you guys enjoyed that. 
as I said, this is one of the first times in a long time we've shot in the evening and it was really, really pleasant. Hopefully the beautiful light translates on the screen for you guys too. So there you go. Thanks for hanging in there and helping me repot, refresh, and revitalize the Silverado Sage. Well, if you held on this long, here is my outfit of the day. Kind of just tough, working out in the yard kind of clothing. Um, I have my cool job gloves. My earrings are those beaded colorful hoops that I got on Amazon, and I'll try to put a link if I remember. My sweatshirt is H&M, and I really like it because it's just the right weight. It's not too heavy for this time of year, but it is kind of cool out today, the perfect kind of weather to garden in. My britches are Eddie Bauer, I believe, and I've had them for years, and my boots are another style of these high C boots that I really, really like so much. And these are great for really, um, they're, they're wonderful in extremely cold weather because they keep your feet really, really warm, but also because they're tough on the bottom. Can you see that, Stuart, how tough they are on the bottom? So they're great for digging and things. So have I forgotten anything? It's pretty casual today. There you go, there's your outfit of the day.